So I just want to formally welcome everybody to today's webinar. And my name is Kylie Hanish. I'm the founder of Return to Zero Hope. And I myself experienced the loss of my son, Norbert. He was still born at 35 weeks back in 2005. Um, I'm honored to be here to present to you all who are doing the very important work of working with grieving families. And I'm hoping that we can shed some light that will help you increase your confidence when working with grieving families. So I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen now. And of course, this is not exactly working. There. Okay, there, I think we're good. So I'm gonna go back to my first slide here. So we're talking about supporting parents after pregnancy and infant loss. This is a webinar directed more towards mental health and peer support providers, but not limited to that, but it's not focused on the time in the hospital per se. And I just wanna express my gratitude to the Spreading Hope and Smiles Foundation who graciously sponsored this webinar. So thank you to them and that they specifically wanted a webinar for this population of providers. So today, here are the learning objectives. So we're gonna talk about mental health risk factors and reactions to perinatal loss. We're gonna identify specific techniques to use with perinatal loss clients. We're gonna talk about suggestions on how to support parents developing an attachment to their new baby during subsequent pregnancies, and also describe the mental health implications during pregnancy after loss. So some of this will be focused on immediately after the loss, and some of it will be focused on if the person becomes pregnant again. The other thing I wanna say is you can use the chat box to ask questions, but I'm not gonna be looking at them until the very end. And I'll leave some time for Q and A at the end. So just to go over the different types of perinatal loss, when we say perinatal loss, what's included in this? And most of these seem pretty evident. Um, I just want to highlight the termination for medical reasons, making sure that you're including that when you refer to perinatal loss, when someone receives a diagnosis that's life-limiting or fatal to their baby, or there's a diagnosis that threatens the mother's health, um, they may need to end a wanted pregnancy. But this is equally as distressing as these other situations. And even though it seems like there's a decision, there's often not really a real decision, like something is wrong and their baby or the mother is not going to live. So just making sure that when we're saying pregnancy and infant loss, that we're including termination for medical reasons. So I wanna start by saying, it's really important to validate all losses. And it doesn't matter how long a woman is pregnant, right? That sometimes we will overlook miscarriage. And, and with, a, with a pregnancy, we know that parents start attaching to the baby when they become pregnant, right? They, everything in their mind changes and they start shifting their plans and their dreams for the future, all of that. So they start attaching to the baby and they also start transitioning into the role as parent when they become pregnant. So when they have a loss, it shatter, shatters their innocence, right? Like it's like, maybe they've heard of miscarriage, maybe they've heard of stillbirth, but maybe they haven't. And you also don't know when someone has an earlier loss that we might brush off as, oh, it's just a 
eight week miscarriage or whatever, something that we don't think is quite as terrible as a stillbirth, you, we may not know how many times they've been pregnant or how long they've been trying to get pregnant, like what their fertility journey has looked like. So there's just a lot of things that maybe are underneath the surface that we don't know about. And it's just really important to validate this particular loss, validate their grief, not minimizing their feelings. So I just wanted to start with that. I'm going to talk a little bit about grieving in the BIPOC community. So as you may have heard, stillbirth rates of non-Hispanic Black mothers compared to all other races combined is two to one. So it's twice as likely for a Black woman to have a stillbirth as all other races combined. And Black mothers are 2.3 times as likely to have a, a preterm birth and that most the most prevalent cause of death of black babies is premature birth. So there's a lot of statistics stacking up against black mothers and babies. And so why is this? Well, straight out, I'm gonna say, this is the result of racism. And we have the term weathering where black women face accumulated stress and they're more likely to be affected by the accumulated stress as a result of discrimination. And so the social environmental factors that cause these cause the chronic, chronic stress can lead to the deterioration of health in Black women and in their pregnancies. Systemic racism and implicit bias are the social and economic forces of systemic racial bias, not race itself, that compromises the health of Black women and the health of their future children. In addition, many Black mothers are not taken seriously for their pain. And they're also, if there seems to be something wrong, they're brushed aside. They may have more limited access to health care. And how this might affect you, there's a stigma against mental health services. So we need to choose language carefully that helps destigmatize the use of mental health services. We have a section on our website as well as multiple webinars that you can learn more about this. Um, really good webinars. So I encourage you to take some time to watch those. I'm also going to talk about loss in the LGBTQ community. So within this specific community, the family building journey is quite complex. So we have systemic discrimination in the healthcare system. So for instance, language on forms, um, the birth certificate, it says mother and father instead of parent one and parent two, and people have to cross things out. So there's that. Also in society, just discrimination and fear of differences, right? Of people different and building families in a different way than has been traditionally done. And because it's different, people are afraid. And then within the family building journey, there's the financial burden. So insurance coverage varies for fertility treatments for LGBTQ persons. And there's the potential to have to pay a lot of money out of pocket. Additionally, there are many types of losses. So we tend to think of losses as miscarriage, stillbirth, infant death, termination for medical reasons. In addition though, if you're looking at the fertility journey, there is the loss of many things, but for example, a failed egg retrieval, failed IUI, failed IVF, multiple of these. And the compounding of these losses makes it even more difficult. And then there's a lack of support for non-gestational parents. 
So as we know, parents have different experiences when a baby dies, but they're both valid and real. The partners, um, the non-gestational parent partners, their grief can be delayed because they're the one holding things together. They're communicating with other people, the family, the, their, friend, their friends, um, and their grief often goes unacknowledged. So it's like they're not really given permission to, to, to grieve and they're holding everything together. And so their grief can be delayed. They need their own support. So when you're working with families, making sure that the partner is being asked how they're doing and that anything you offer to the birthing parent, you're also offering to the partner as well. We have a section on our website devoted to losses in the LGBTQ community. We have a webinar up there and we're hoping to build more on that. So I encourage you to take a look at that as well if you're interested in learning more. I'm going to now talk about ending a wanted pregnancy or termination for medical reasons. So with, in this specific situation, there is a stigma against abortion in our country. And so people feel that, and they may have legal barriers to terminating, terminating a pregnancy, which adds even more stress to a very, very challenging situation. They may have to travel for a procedure. They may have to go to an abortion clinic if their doctor is not able or willing to perform the procedure. So that exists. That's kind of what's going on in society. The parents, there's this false illusion, as I mentioned before, of making a decision, that you're not really making a decision, that you're choosing pain for yourself over pain for your baby. Um, and the services available really vary, you know, from what I've been learning, it's like, it depends on <clears throat> the type of procedure you want may not be what you're able to have, or, and this depends on insurance coverage. What is the insurance willing to cover? What about your provider? What about the hospital? They may not cover these services. There's time limitations per state. There may not be enough time from the time you find out something's wrong to see all the specialists and try to make the best decision on what is that life for your baby going to look like? like what's the situation? And they only have two weeks or one week to make this decision and have the procedure done. So time is a huge thing. And then the procedure itself. So there are the surgical options, which is the DNC or a DNE. So a DNC is in the first <clears throat> trimester. A DNE can be in the second trimester, but um, oftentimes once you reach over 20 weeks, you're going to do a labor induction. You also have to consider in here that insurances a lot of time will not pay for the labor induction. So even though the parent may want that, they can't financially afford it. So they aren't able to create the experience that they want for their child because of these other factors. So again, as I mentioned in the previous two slides, we do have a section on our website devoted to this. We have one webinar for providers specifically about ending a wanted pregnancy that I encourage you to take a look at. So now, Interacting with bereaved parents. How do we do this in a way that we, you know, it's normal to feel really scared and unsure of, of what to do or what to say. And I just want to normalize that for you. Like, it's okay to be scared. And it's okay also if it's bringing stuff up within ourselves, right? If we've had a loss of a child, it will definitely bring that up. If we've had other losses in our family, maybe recently, the grief is raw and you'll connect to that. And you're a human and that's, that could happen. So what do patients initially experience like when, they're, when they learn about the diagnosis? So there's shock and disbelief in the beginning. Um, they could 
there could be cr lots of crying and there could also just be shut down and both are completely normal. There can be anticipatory grief, like just, you know, kind of knowing that they're going to have to grieve and not sure what that's going to look like. That's their fear and anxiety. It's like, what is, what is going to happen? What's going to happen? What's the plan? Um, there's just a lot of unknowns that are going to be coming up and there's a lot of fear around unknowns and uncertainties. And then people are left making impossible decisions, decisions that they never thought they would have to make. Like, am I going to bury my baby or cremate them or so holding my deceased child, which can seem really scary. Um, and then they're second guessing their decisions because right like in a time of shock, we're not able to make the best decisions. And do we have someone there guiding us? So how can we support parents? And this is like always, but especially in the beginning, right? So showing the parents empathy, being there and listening, holding space for them to be present with their grief, referring to the fetus as a baby or child, right? Like making sure you're not, you're not calling it fetal demise they say your baby died. Um, if the baby, you can ask, did you name your baby? And if they did, calling the baby by name. That's very comforting towards parents. Not all parents are going to name their child and that's okay. Um, sometimes with earlier losses, they don't wanna connect to that baby as their child. Some do. And I think that all you have to do is ask, like don't assume anything. Um, ask them. And sometimes I will also say that they may need some guidance in saying that this has been helpful for other parents to name your baby, things like that. So in terms of what not to say, so these are just a list of things that people say that can be hurtful. And I think that it's just important to acknowledge in our society, we're uncomfortable with death and an out of order death of a baby makes it even more challenging. People are at a loss for words, but it's important that we don't, we don't tell them that everything happens for a reason or everything's gonna be okay, or God has a plan. Try not to impose your own beliefs. Try not to judge them and try not to compare losses. So you may have had your own loss. And I think that that can be important to share if that can connect you to that person. And it's okay to show emotion, but making sure that they're not having to come for you. But what's helpful to say? So there's a lot of pressure put on you, right? Like in this very fragile state, every word and action of a provider will have a large impact on the parents. And so just being really mindful of what you're saying, um, coming into it with, a, with like an open heart and practicing ahead of time, like what can I say? So here's just some ideas, but like, we're here to guide and support you through this. They need someone to be their guide through this very chaotic time. <clears throat> I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm at a loss for words. Ask about the baby's name, you know, tell them their baby is beautiful. You know, if, if you see the baby or if you if you're seeing them after ask to see a picture if they have a picture because i'm sure that's something they can't share with most people so now moving on to perinatal loss and mental health so this is one of my favorite things to talk about just because i personally have been through quite a lot of of implications through my 
loss and my future pregnancies and um, having to learn a lot on my own about this and wishing people would have talked about it to me ahead of time. So mental health after loss is complex. So we have grief, of course, right? Like someone has died, but this is an out of order death. And so there's often trauma to be associated with it. So nothing is wrong with grief per se, like grief is normal and to be expected. And it, it has its own journey and there's no right or wrong way to do it. But then you add trauma in there and bereaved parents have seven or seven times more likely to experience symptoms of PTSD than non-bereaved parents. So the trauma piece is very, very real. And then postpartum mood and anxiety disorders. So what that is, is, you know, one in five women are at risk of developing some kind of postpartum mental health complication after a live birth. But in this case, there has been a birth of some kind and all the body and hormonal changes are happening, but there's not a live baby. But postpartum is very real. And so you're adding grief and trauma in with that. Like there's just a lot that can come up and there's other risk factors too, but these are just things that, to be aware of if they're all happening. And for example, bereaved parents are four times as likely to develop symptoms of depression as non-bereaved parents, right? So it just puts bereaved parents in a much higher category and chance of developing some kind of mental health complication. These are some common thing, themes among bereaved parents. And if you're working with bereaved parents, you've probably heard them, but right, the number one thing I hear is feeling alone and isolated, and that people come to support groups and and seeking out that community because they feel like they're the only one who's been through this and they feel just like they don't fit in. So that's very real. You know, there's a lot of kind of self blame, feel that their bodies have failed them, a lot of shame and guilt, right? Because if, if the mother is the one who carried the baby, sometimes there's a feeling like in her circles that it was her fault that she did something. And most of the time she didn't. There can be anger towards health providers and avoidance of health providers. So sometimes parents will choose not to go back to the same provider because they don't wanna be a, to associate a new pregnancy with the loss. And then sometimes they will go to the same provider so they don't have to explain everything. It just depends. And we do know that loss in general, like this type of loss changes relationships with your spouse, your partner, your family, and your friends. Like they will be drastically changed and this is normal. Okay, so speaking of trauma, what are typical trauma symptoms? So here we can just go over some of these. You can glance through them. Um, I think a few that I wanna highlight are the anxiety piece. So hypervigilance can feel like anxiety of just like this fear of something going wrong, fear that someone's going to die, things like that is a very common trauma response after losing a child. There can be flashbacks to the loss or blackouts around that whole loss experience. Um, I'd also encourage you to ask about sleeping. So how is a person sleeping? That can be an indicator of what's going on emotionally. So a lot of times if people are not sleeping, then there's, there's that hypervigilance anxiety piece that's coming into play that's maybe not playing out, but it's coming out during sleep. Or maybe they're just laying around and then they're just like paralyzed and can't do anything. So I think these are just, it's good for you to be aware of these and then also to ask about certain things.
excuse me. Um, okay, <clears throat> looking at suicidal thinking impaired in a loss. So <clears throat> there's a difference between someone <clears throat> wanting to end their life and someone not wanting to be alive. So it is common for people to not want to be alive after the baby dies. They like, I, they say, I can't go on without my baby. I want to be with my baby. Um, Self-blame, if I haven't done, I haven't eaten, if I didn't eat that deli meat, my baby would have lived. If I didn't have that glass of wine, but like I should be punished. The thing is, is when it moves into wanting to take their own life, so then we need to act, right? And I think you have to take all, all of the all of this language that people say as very seriously and have a plan for suicidal thoughts. And at the same time, exploring it and seeing where they are. Do they, are they making a plan or are they just like, I don't wanna live life with my baby and just see where they are and kind of what help they need from there. Cause this is something you, you may have to have to refer out for. I'd like to touch on fathers and partners as well. So partners experience a loss as well. The focus is often on the birthing parent, but the partners are going through this experience as well. And there is often delayed grief. So I mentioned this in the LGBTQ slide, um, but the same is relevant here. So the partner is assuming the supportive role. They're the communicator with provider, with family and friends, and they're acting as a filter. <clears throat> they're neglecting their own grief. There's also a lack of reg recognition of the partner's grief. So this is part of like societal constructs, um, gender of like the partner and oftentimes men like are supposed to be strong and they're not emotional. There's stigma against men being emotional, but this happens in LGBTQ couples too that the partners are ignored. And so while some of it is gender-based, it's not all. Um, and then what does grief and trauma look like in men? It looks different than it does in women often, not all the time, but often. So sometimes emotions, there can be flat affect or lack of emotion, irritability, anger, lashing out, it can be risk-taking behaviors like reckless driving, extramarital affairs, substance abuse. They could be hyper-focused on work as a distraction. Maybe they isolate themselves. Maybe there's a lack of focus and motivation to do things. There's also guilt. That they'll have some guilt and shame too, but this may come out more in the irritability or anger. Um, and, and then you also have the fact that partners are not grieving on the same timeline. And so they may be grieving differently and they may be grieving similarly, but not at the same time. They're like in different places. And I think we just have to be really aware of that too. Like each person is on their own journey and they need support from other people and they can't be each other's only support. So I'm gonna talk about paternal postnatal depression next. So with this, what is it? So have you heard of it or not? 
Um, it is a real thing here. And so paternal postnatal depression happens with live births and also in stillbirths or infant deaths, right? So it's, a, it, it's about six, three to six months postpartum when this flares up in fathers. And the first year, the first year paternal postnatal depression rates in the United States are up to 25% of men. So that's one in four men potentially could encounter this. You know, with birth loss or birth trauma, men have the same risk of developing PTSD as their partners. Okay, so we need to pay attention to this. And fathers are often ignored. And so with this, we need to be asking about the partners and not only the birthing parent. What are risk factors? Risk factors are maternal depression is the number one risk factor for postnatal depression in fathers. And when this is the case, the rate is between 25 and 50%. And if you look at parents with a NICU stay, up to 33% of men experience PTSD and 36% of men experience depression. So mental health concerns in fathers when there's birth trauma or loss is very real. It's underdiagnosed, mostly because the pre and postnatal care is geared towards the mother baby dyad. And there's also a low self-report due to stigma attached to mental health and mood disorders. And there's also an awareness of this, like people aren't aware that this is a thing and so we need to be talking about it and educating parents during the prenatal period. So what are symptoms? So similarly to trauma symptoms, it looks like increased anger and irritability, increased substance abuse. Maybe there's violent behavior going on, isolation from friends and family, increased stress, impulsiveness, as I mentioned before, right? Like they're escaping into work, risk-taking behavior, those type of things. And so lack of education around this and lack of research means most men experiencing this aren't aware of it and it's not treated. So what is the impact of loss on relationships? Well, so loss changes relationships, as I mentioned before, right? So it's natural that your relationship to yourself and other people is going to change with such a devastating and life-changing experience. <clears throat> Everybody grieves in their own way and their own time. And as I mentioned before, this is called incongruent grief. They're not on the same timelines. There's a delayed grief in some people um, and, and we can generalize a little bit and say men tend to think or do grief and women tend to feel their way. Um, and, and this could be for various factors, but there's just differences in coping styles. Um, and so just asking, you know, or observing and asking, how are you grieving? individually. And it's important to talk about finding support outside of each other. Like they have each other, but can they find support from a therapist and individual, like maybe they're seeing a couple's therapist, but can they have their own therapist? Are they in a support group? And it's important to honor each other's differences, um, that we can't control the way that someone is processing their grief and, and letting them kind of go through the, their own journey. And then I would say like, ask about intimacy, like how has this impacted some, their, the couple's intimacy? And sometimes it will bring couples together and sometimes it will pull them apart. 
And so just having that be a topic of conversation as well to normalize that both are could happen um, and bringing it out into the open. And so, like, as I said before, the importance of finding support outside of each other, honoring your differences, and it's not your job to fix, you know, it's not the brave parents job to fix their partner. They need to worry about themselves when they're in that total survival mode. And of course, they're going to be there for each other. But how can their own support systems help them come back to themselves, right, before that they can come back to each other? So looking at the impact on relationships when we're talking about friends and family. So So relationships with other people can be the most complicated at times. They can be triggering, they can be emotionally exhausting and they can be hurtful and disappointing. People aren't going to necessarily respond to parents the way that they need, the parents need people to respond to them. Um, and the, the loss may have triggered feelings in other family members, right? Like the other family members are grieving as well, or it could have triggered some other loss in their life. Um, unresolved losses that they need to process. And whether they do so or not is not necessarily in our control. Some people are going to be comfortable with the parents sharing information and some will not be comfortable. And again, there can be a lot of hurt feelings and feeling the parents feeling unsupported. And we have a society that's uncomfortable with grief anyways. And so people don't know what to say or do. They're just feeling uncomfortable. And so a lot of times when they say things that are hurtful, it's not necessarily of malicious intent. It's just, they don't know. They're trying to fix or help. And so they're kind of doing their best that they can do. And I think sometimes it works if the parents express what they need and some people will listen and adjust accordingly and some people will not. So how do we, how do we deal with this really? So some suggestions when working with parents are, number one, help them to prioritize where does the energy go, what, right? A grieving parent has very limited reserves of energy and help them pay attention to who is feeding them and who's depleting them. Who, do, who can they spend time with? and who can that they spend time with. And sometimes this is um, setting these boundaries are temporary until they're feeling better and have more capacity. And sometimes relationships do change forever and you lose friends. And that is a normal part of this. But there's also the opportunity to create new relationships. Relationships with people that you share your loss with and they've been through a loss and you didn't know about it, right? There's a bond there, relationships with other bereaved parents. Um, also just trying to help people let go of expectations of others, which is really, really hard, but people are going to let parents down. It's, it's going to happen and so, helping the parents understand that it's not about them, right? It's not, it's not about them, it's about the other person. And at the same time, holding space for their feelings and letting them feel sad. But they're not responsible for how other people feel or act. And I know that's really hard, especially when you're in such a tender state. Again, like it's, it's a hard place to be. So navigating life after loss, what is helpful? Okay, so most of these, 
you're going to know because you're doing the work, right? Social support of family and friends, support groups for bereaved parents, very helpful in finding community with other bereaved parents. Movement. We know that grief and trauma are stored in the body. And so movement is one way to kind of get that energy unstuck, to move it. Being in nature is very healing. So can we get outside of where we are into nature with trees and water and animals, that type of stuff to really connect us to earth, to ground us. Ongoing bonds with the deceased child. So this, this will work for some people and not for others, but if the parent is open to it, the idea that there are continued bonds that last beyond the physical lifetime, that they can have a connection with their deceased child and helping them to figure out what that looks like for them. How are they gonna parent their child who's not here with them in person? And then as time goes on, creating meaning, how do you create meaning? How do you create meaning out of this really devastating experience that's happened? And making your child's life, you know, doing something for somebody else to make your child's life not in vain. And then ritual, like the ritual of visiting the cemetery. Maybe it's lighting a candle, or doing something on an annual basis, something like that. Those things can be helpful as well. Self-care is another big piece of this. So it's, it's, right, it's not necessarily just the indulgent where that picture is a little bit indulgent, taking a bath with tea and candle and book, which that is beautiful, but it's anything you do to really take care of yourself on a physical level, emotional, spiritual level. It's a daily practice, right? So it's maintenance that we have to do every single day. And the obvious daily practices are sleep, nutrition, water, exercise. Um, and then it's like, then what else? What are the extra things? But those are the necessary things. Setting boundaries is a form of self-care. So it's helpful to live a conscious life an intentional life. You know, so right in the beginning, self-care can be a lot about survival. Parents saying no to people in order to say yes to themselves. But this can be temporary boundaries. But later on, boundaries can be there as preventive measures to make sure that they have the reserves for handling what life is going to bring to them. Um, social media can be an area that needs to have boundaries set around it, right? Like can be triggering to see everyone's perfect life. Um, and it's okay to take a break from that or to unfollow certain people. So, and then mindfulness. Um, mindfulness and meditation, connecting to the breath, it's just really, again, there can be a disconnection with yourself when you go through this type of loss and helping to create being present and able to focus your mind in order to make decisions from that grounded place. So I mentioned this a little bit before continuing bonds. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it um, because I still have a lot to get through. So, but the idea, right, that you can still have this relationship with your deceased child, even though they're not there in person with you. Um, and I'm not sure who of you have heard about this, but fetal microchimerism is this really amazing concept of the, the fetal cells from baby A here go into the mother 
and the mother cells goes into the baby, right? So in the mother's body, she has the fetal cells within her body from baby A. And then she goes on to have baby B and cells from baby A and the mother are in baby B and cells from baby B are in the mother. So the mother, each mother will have cells from her babies within her. So even if the baby has died, there's that comfort that the baby's cells are within that mother's body. Creating connections to baby. So these are just some ideas of ways parents can connect to, to their child. Um, because this is something that can be really new to people that they, people need guidance on what is seemed like seen as, as normal and has been helpful to other, to other parents. So we have a section on our website for you to read more of these. These are just some ideas that um, people tend to engage in, but there's a lot of different ways and it's really individual to the person, to the parents, what they wanna do. And then looking at special days, right? So anniversaries, birthdays, holidays can be really difficult, especially in the first year. So there's a physical grief that can resurface. That's really common, um, especially like before the baby's due date or before the baby's anniversary dates. So I think it can be helpful for you to let the parent know that like, hey, you're gonna have some anticipatory grief and they may not even know what it is. They might just feel sick. Um, and there's <clears throat> the worry about, well, am, is what I'm gonna do gonna be good enough to honor my baby? Is it gonna be big enough? And there's a lot of worry about that. And so how can we help parents walk them through this. So help them to identify their expectations of the day. What are their expectations for this? So let's just say it's like the first anniversary. What are your expectations? What is your intention for the day? Make a plan. So setting an intention that they're gonna honor their baby in the own way that feels right to them. And it's gonna be different than anybody else. And that's okay. Can you help them brainstorm about what might feel good? Can you talk through ideas and come up with a general plan? It doesn't have to be like an hour by hour plan, but just generally, what do they wanna do that day? Do they want other people involved, how that, can they communicate that with those people? Do they wanna be alone? Maybe they wanna binge watch a TV show all day, just like get through the day and that's okay too. Um, but just helping them, let me go back a second. Helping them to really make that plan. And I think if you're working with somebody and you have the ability to do this, sending a card, we're sending a text, I'm thinking about you today. I know it's a really hard day. If it's Mother's Day or Father's Day, you know, I know that it's a really hard day or I see you as a mother, I see you as a father, things like that. Um, you know, that may or may not be possible, but that's just an idea. So here's some ideas and all this is on our website as well of ideas, um, what people can do for these special days. So this can be something you could like print out, give to your client or the people you're working with to like go through this. Like, just do you identify with any of these? These are some ideas. It can be, it can be a good tool for you all. Um, I'm going to now talk a little bit about pregnancy after loss and because I think that it's important that this is part of the conversation because 50 to 80 percent 
of parents who've experienced a loss will become pregnant again. But pregnancy after loss is a traumatic experience. And that being pregnant again is the biggest reminder of your loss. Okay, so you have to remember that being pregnant again is the biggest reminder of the parent's loss. And having a subsequent healthy pregnancy does not resolve any mental health problems that the parents experienced after their loss. Rather, having the loss is a risk factor for developing mental health complications. Okay, so the new baby is not gonna solve all problems. The pregnancy itself is a time of complex emotions. So there is the fear and anxiety about being pregnant again, the fear of losing your baby. And at the same time, there is maybe some hope and some excitement for bringing a live baby into this world, but that baby will never replace the baby that has died. And so parents who are pregnant, again, have to hold both of these emotions at the same time, right? Grief and attachment. And it can be really hard for parents to form attachment to subsequent children during pregnancy, after pregnancy, there could be denial of the pregnancy because they're afraid to lose the baby again. And there could be parents feel responsible for being sad in order to not forget about their deceased child. And there's just, there's a lot of like feeling guilt over the baby who's died, not wanting to get attached to the baby who's coming because of fear of loss. So these are just really real parts of pregnancy after loss. And they're all normal. They're all normal parts of it. So here, loss as a risk factor. So I mentioned that before. Loss is a risk factor for mental health complications and subsequent pregnancies, right? So it could lead to um, poor fetal outcomes during subsequent pregnancies. It can negatively affect attachment to the subsequent child. Um, we just need to really be aware that, that the new baby is not, it can, it may be healing, but all of that other stuff is still there. And just some statistics about stillbirth and subsequent pregnancies. So there's significantly more depression in the third trimester um, during subsequent pregnancies. There's higher anxiety for pregnancies that occur within a year of stillbirth. Okay, so there is some, some research out there that says like waiting a little bit of time can actually help decrease anxiety. And 21% of women reported PTSD symptoms in the third trimester in subsequent pregnancies. So it's, this is very, very real. And we just need to be aware of this and normalize it for them and help give them tools to work through it. So helping parents navigate pregnancy after loss. Okay, so acknowledging that this is, that their loss is affecting their current pregnancy and encouraging them to share their feelings, right? Holding space for them, normalizing by educating the parents, preparing them for what emotions and thoughts might come up, giving them language to help describe what they're feeling and empowerment. Where can we give parents a sense of control? Do they have unanswered questions to their previous loss? Can you help them find someone to answer those questions? Um, can you guide them in like going to a medical appointment, like asking for what they need? Like maybe they need to ask for an appointment at certain times of the day so they're not sitting with other pregnant people. Maybe they need to ask to be put in a room right away. Um, can they ask to see the heartbeat first when they get an ultrasound or hear the heartbeat first in the appointment to just calm that anxiety that's there? And passing a gestational stage of loss may or may not help the parents 
be less anxious. So for example, if you had a loss at 24 weeks and you it was due to a certain, like an insufficient cervix, and you found that out and you had the cervical stitch and then you get past that point, you may be calmer for the rest of the pregnancy, may or may not. But for people who had later term stillbirths, there's no time in the pregnancy that they're going to feel safe again and can breathe until the baby is born. And so just some other suggestions. You can help by honoring the deceased child. Don't be afraid to bring up that baby who died. You know, it's in that parent's head. So calling that baby by name, knowing, like, knowing if there's anniversary dates that are coming up that you can bring up and kind of honor the child that way. Allowing the parent to process unresolved grief. grief. Like that's still going to be happening this time. Um, facilitating the connection to the baby that died. Like you can help with that. And you can also help with attaching to the new baby, right? So like taking their concerns really seriously, but also letting them know like, this is a different pregnancy. This is a different baby. Can you link the baby, the new baby to the other baby who passed away as siblings? So just some ideas on things you can do here. What's going on? Hmm. Hold on. Okay. Sorry, my slides were acting weird. So referring out for support, right? So if you're a therapist, you are the referral out for support. But what else can you encourage parents to do? I mean, I said this before, movement, exercise, yoga, right? To move some of that grief and trauma support groups for bereaved parents, for pregnancy after loss, for parenting after loss can be very, very helpful. Um, acupuncture can be helpful, right? For regulating, like helping a woman's body get kind of re-regulated after birth or after fertility treatments, that type of stuff, during fertility treatments. And then psychiatry, like at a certain point, you're gonna have to help the parent judge like do they need some um, medical intervention to help them get through this really difficult time it doesn't mean it's forever but they may need help there so i just want to share um in, you know as i come to the end here we have brochures on our website of many different topics they're free um, we have them printed that you can order or we have them in downloadable pdfs and then Everything is downloadable in English and Spanish as well. We also have online support groups. We do closed six week groups. We have termination for medical reasons, pregnancy after loss, parenting after loss, recurrent pregnancy loss, in addition to pregnancy and infant loss. We have a directory here, which is here, and I can send the slides out to those of you who are watching live. Um, I have a direct, we have a directory that has the therapists, support groups, psychiatrists, and other support organizations. Um, so you can use that, you can request to be added to that. We have a section for pregnancy after loss. We have a providers page, which includes a monthly consultation group for providers, where you can, for, it can be peer support providers, mental health providers to bring your cases and receive some guidance and support. And then we have a whole webinar li library other than what's here, um, what we're talking about today. We have other webinars, as I mentioned, and they're all free for you to watch. And that, that is all for now. So I would like to open this time up. I know we're at the end of the hour. So opening it up to any questions that anybody might have. Um, there's a lot of information to cover there. And I'm sure that a lot of those can be broken up into their own topics of their own. But um, so if you have a question, if you wouldn't mind typing it in the chat box, that would be terrific because um, we are in a webinar format and I can't, I don't know how to make you able to talk. 
So I'm going to just um, respond to Barbara's comment about moms that wanted to attend your support group after becoming pregnant again, but it caused tension within the group for those that recently experienced a loss. So in that case, I think that that's that that's the the need for another group for a pregnancy after loss group um, could be helpful, right? Because it is going to be hard for people who are newly in their grief journey. Um, Amber, so I was asked to add a woman to the group who chose to have a non-medical abortion to my group. I feel that it would be two separate groups, but what, yeah, um, we've had this conversation a lot. Um, we, at least at Return to Zero, agree that if it's a non-medical abortion that that it is that our space is not the right space for that person. Um, but but those people need support. It's just we're those are not the people we're supporting. There's a group out there called Exhale that could be helpful. And I don't know if anybody, if anyone's at their computer and look, can look Exhale up, they can put that in the chat box, a link to that group. Um, Sarah, for sleep disturbances, do you have any suggestions? for helping folks to see which is trauma related or possibly an onset of a perineal mood disorder. Um, I don't know that. I mean, I think, I mean, here's kind of what I've come to accept is that the three of those circles that I showed like grief, trauma and PMADS, there's a lot of overlap there. And, um, I don't, it's really hard to flesh out what's what. And so I think that a psychiatrist may be helpful in just, I mean, if you've tried all other things, right? Like, cause you want to try the non-medical interventions first, like acupuncture or calming herbs or CBD oil or stuff like that. But like, sometimes you need something strong. So, um, I don't, I don't know if it's even possible to tease those two things out. And I know that's not the answer that you were looking for, um, but we could ask, I mean, I felt like I've talked this over with Elise Springer too, and she kind of feels the same, but we could ask her in our consult group next Friday too. Okay, Kelly Lockwood, thank you. For, oh, but you just, hold on. You put that in just for us. Um, let me see if I can copy that exhale. Here, let me put it in here. Okay, there. Oh, there, Carla, you did that for me. Thank you. Um, okay, let me go back up. Alexandra, if you establish a relationship with a client and they suffer a miscarriage or a stillbirth, how do you reach out or how long would you follow a mom to help her support her through her grief? Um, well, I think the important thing is, okay, a few things is coming to mind. So number one, we're afraid to reach out, but ignoring them is worse than not reaching out. It's better to reach out. You might have to do it multiple times. They may want to come to you. They may not want to come to you until they're feeling better. And I think that's a little bit, you're going to have to take it on a client by client basis, but you know, I think sending something, a card could be really nice in the beginning, um, but then text, like text check-ins, like, how are you? I'm thinking about you, no need to respond. Um, and when they're ready, they will come back. And how long would you follow a mom? I mean, I would say this first six to 12 months is really, really the hard, I mean, hardest. And then sometimes though, I feel like one, once people get through the first year, they think things should be easier, but they, they've been through the first of things, but then they think that everything should be better and it's not. And they're like, oh, this grief is still sticking around. So I think that it's important to, you know, like let the client lead you, I would say. Um, and, and also bringing in your expertise of what, whether you think that they're 
how they're doing and how they're coping and everybody is gonna do it differently. Um, okay, so it seems that PSI partnered with Exhale to do a virtual support group. So that's great. Um, okay, so if a mom knows that you have access to her medical chart and you reach out to her about miscarriage or stillbirth, do you think, oh, well, I, okay. So she's asking if you, if you have access to her medical chart, but, but the client didn't tell you themselves, would it seem to be an invasion of privacy? Well, so what does HIPAA say about that? Does anybody else know? Um, I mean, I think if legally you have access to her chart and she's aware of that, then I think it's okay. But if it's a if it's not, if she's not aware of that, then there might be a, a trust issue. But if anyone else wants to chime in on that, that might be helpful. I mean, I personally, like from my perspective, if, you know, if I had a still, I mean, or when I had my soul birth, if someone I've been seeing learned about it, like I, I would want that person to call me, but, you know, I think that you can reach out in a gentle manner and they can ignore you or not, you know, not respond if they're not feeling that way. I mean, I think it's a very lonely time and the support we can offer is very important to them. So Sarah's saying, I would maybe ask if there are any losses that they're wanting to disclose and allow for them to choose whether to share or not. I mean, I, so some of it's going to depend on your relationship with this person. Like, are you seeing them regularly? And, and I think if you want, if you, Alexandra, if you'd like to talk more about this, you can come next Friday, 9 a.m. Pacific um, to our providers consultation group if we want, if you want to have further clarification around this. It's a little bit hard with me just talking. We don't hear everyone else's voices. Does anyone have any other questions they want to bring up? Um, I will send out a link to the recording as well as the slide deck and just be sure to use our website for any resources that you might need. So thank you for joining us. I'm going to stop the recording now.